Okay, good. Let's talk about limit. Let's look at this first limit problem on my page. What's the limit of x plus 5 over x minus 2 as x goes to 3? Mm -hmm. Oh, is, is 3 the limit? Okay. As x goes to 3. In other words, all of these okay. limit problems, x is going to go to some number, and you need to figure out what f of x goes to, or y. And the way you do it is the first step you do is just direct substitution. So if you substitute it directly in here, you'll have 8 over 1. So that limit goes to 8. Okay. Okay. Limit problems that come out to be numbers are really easy, obviously. This was not hard. The ones that are hard, are the ones that come out to be 0 over 0. For example, the second one, the one below the line. Notice that by direct substitution, I get 0 over 0, right? Mm -hmm. Well, whenever you get 0 over 0, you have to do more things to evaluate the limit. We don't know what 0 over 0 is. We know 0 over a number is 0, and we know a number over 0 is pretty much undefined. It's infinity. So <coughs> numbers over numbers are easy. 0 over a number is easy. The difficult ones are where you get 0 over 0. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we do when we get 0 over 0? Well, the first thing you try to do is factor wherever you can. And notice that I can factor that numerator. That's difference of perfect squares. So I can factor it into x minus 1 over x plus 1. And then I'm going to divide that by x minus 1. Now notice I can cancel those x minus 1s. And now this limit actually goes to a number. It goes to 2. And that is the answer. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, I looked at two that you sent me before I accidentally deleted it. Let me pull them up here. This first one. Notice that it's going to be 0 over 0. They all are, the tough ones. They'll, they'll stop giving you easy ones pretty quickly. And, and the only ones you'll get are 0 over 0. Okay? Notice mm -hmm. that if I substitute 4 for x, I get 16 minus 24 plus 8. That's 0. And I get 0 in the denominator. So I have to do something else besides just direct substitution. Always think factoring is your first step. Factor the numerator. What is x squared minus 6x plus 8 factor into? And this is actually a little easier than a typical factoring problem because you kind of know x minus 4 is one of the factors. Mm -hmm. because we're dividing by x minus 4. So 90% of the time, there's going to be an x minus 4 in the numerator. Well, what's the other factor? If x minus 4 is one of them, what's the second one? 2. Plus or minus. And x what? Um, oh, plus. No. Or no, is it minus? X minus 2. Minus. Remember that the only way you can produce a plus 8, remember how you get that plus 8. That is the L of FOIL. Right. Or you get it by multiplying minus 4 times minus 2. So when you're going the other direction, when you're factoring, you know that you got to have two signs that are the same. There's no way it could produce a plus 8 if these signs were opposite. Mm-hmm. And so they're either plus plus or minus minus 
Look to the middle term, which has a minus in it. That tells you they're minus minus. It's straightforward as that. Okay. And now I'm trying to take the limit of this thing as x goes to 4. Well, notice the very first thing that happens. I'm going to cancel that x minus 4 out with that x minus 4. And now what's the limit of x minus 2 as x goes to 4? Is it 2? Uh-huh. Okay. Limit problems are actually pretty easy once you get the hang of them. Right. It's been a while, too, since I've done that. Well, so. and factoring is not always... Everybody generally has difficulty with factoring, and that never goes away. Just because <laughs> you go much time at all without factoring, you forget how to do it. Right. This one is as x goes to 6. Well, that makes the denominator 0. I can guarantee you, without even doing the math, that it makes the numerator 0 also. 36 minus 42 plus 10. It doesn't make the numerator 0. Wow, I'm wrong. So here, let's look at this. So I'm taking the limit of this thing as x goes to 6. Well, by direct substitution, what do you get? Um, so you get 36 minus 42, which 42 is negative plus 6, 10. plus 10, you get plus 4. Okay. Over 0, so it's just undefined. Yes. Okay. Anything divided by zero is undefined. It's basically infinity, but they don't like using that word. And also, there are some special things about limits. Have you had limits from the left and limits from the right yet? Um, yes. Okay. The reason this thing is undefined is because the limit from the left is negative infinity, and the limit from the right is positive infinity. Since those two are not the same, it by definition does not exist. It's actually not undefined. That's probably not the correct word. It does not exist. For a limit to exist has to be the same from the right-hand side as the left-hand side. That's okay. the very first definition. Otherwise, if it's not the same, it does not exist. Okay. And notice that when I approach 6 from the left-hand side, the denominator is going to be negative. Whereas mm -hmm. I approach it from the right-hand side, the denominator is going to be positive. So that's why they're not the same from the left and the right. I guess I can just scroll down to keep seeing. Mm -hmm. okay. Evaluate the limit if it exists. And we have t squared minus 4 all over 2t squared plus 5t plus 2. Now, you haven't had any calculus at all yet, have you? Um, no. Okay. All calculus starts out with limits. So usually if a person is studying limits, next step is going to be calculus. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm taking, I could give you a really easy way to do these zero over zeros if you had any calculus, but since you don't, we'll do it the hard way. Okay, notice that as I plug in minus 2, numerator goes to 0. Denominator goes to 0. See why? Mm -hmm. 8 minus 10 plus 2. So it's 0 over 0. Now, Technically, 0 over 0 is indeterminate. 
That's what it's called, always, indeterminate. Because it could be a bunch of stuff. It could be a zero, it could be infinity, it could be a number, it could be anything, anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. So the way we need to solve it, again, is by factor. We'll factor the top. That's difference of perfect squares. How's that factor? Um, t plus 2 and t minus 2. Uh -huh. And factor the bottom, knowing that one of the factors is going to be t plus 2. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just know that going in. In other words, it makes your factoring much easier. That's actually a, a reasonably difficult one to factor, but what would it factor into? Especially if I know that t plus 2 has to be one of them. Well, what's the other one? This has got to be 2t. What's the rest of it got to be? Um, is it 2t plus 5 or 3? Always know that these last two numbers have to be factors of this constant. Oh, right. Okay. I forgot. Oh, then it's, is it 2? Well, 2 times 2 would be 4. 4, oh. Um, what times 2 is equal to 2? Oh, 1. Yes, that's what it has to be. And then if you were to foil those two denominators together, you'd get what we started with. Right. But now notice what happens. The t plus 2s cancel, and now resubstitute the same exact number that you had before, what do you get? Um, you get negative 4 on the top and then um, negative 3 on the bottom, so 4 thirds. Yeah, exactly. And usually with these, especially at this level, is all you have to do is factor it once and you're going to turn it into a number over a number or a number over 0 or something that you can immediately come up with an answer. Now, the number five. What do you get with direct substitution? As um, you'll get um, a number over zero. No, you'll get zero over zero. Oh, zero. If you got a number over zero, it'd be easy. We just say it does not exist. Go on to the next one. But you actually get minus three squared is plus nine. Oh, right. Yeah. Nine minus nine is zero over zero. And notice I can't factor here. But what can I do? Um, can you take the root? Expand. Expand oh. the numerator. What do you get when you expand the numerator? Um, you do that by... Um, Multiply minus 3 plus h times minus 3 plus h. Foil it. Oh, okay, so... So you get 9 minus 3h minus 3h. Which is minus 6h. Minus 6h. And then minus 9, right? So it's um, don't forget six. the plus h squared. Oh. That's what I get when I expand that expression. And then I have minus 9. Okay. Go all over h. Now condense that and factor. In other words, the 9's cancel. And you're left with everything having an h in it. So factor an h out of the top. What do you get? I factor a plus h out of the top. Get negative 6 plus h. Okay. 
still have H in the bottom. Those H yes. now I can cancel. So now I got negative 6 plus H. What's that go to as H goes to 0? <coughs> um, just negative 6. That's the answer. Okay. Okay. So always think factoring, although there are harder ones where you can't factor like this one. But there's still a way to do it. When you have something like this, notice that direct substitution, we get 0 over 0. Right? Mm -hmm. And I can't factor. I, I can't factor anything. I can't expand. So I can't really do much of anything, but when you see a problem like this, think, multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the complicated thing, which is the top. Okay? I can always multiply top and bottom by the same thing. Hold on. So I'm going to multiply it by square root of 36 plus h minus 6. Only I'm going to do the conjugate. And if I multiply the top by that, I'm going to multiply the bottom by that. See what I did? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, turns out, when I multiply those tops together, it's going to lose the radical sign. Here, let me blow it up a little bit so i got a little more room to write. When you multiply these two numerators, notice there will be no middle term. The middle terms are going to cancel. They always do when you multiply something by its conjugate. So, this radical times that radical leaves you 36 plus h. Still got minus 6 times plus 6, which is minus 36. And now in the bottom, never multiply these two together. Just leave them like this. With me? Mm -hmm. The top, the 36 is cancel, and I'm left with an H, which I can then cancel out with the bottom H. So this whole thing goes to 1 over square root of 36 plus H plus 6. Now substitute 0 for H, and what do you get? Um, so you get 1 over 12. Huh? So this is method number 2. There, as long as there's no trig functions involved, usually there's only two methods you need to consider. One is factoring and the other is multiplying by the conjugate. Okay. Okay, you know what I mean by the conjugate. If I'm multiplying mm -hmm. by a plus b, then I'm multiplying by a minus b. Right. That's the conjugate. And notice that always turns out to be a squared minus b squared. That's difference of squares. So when you multiply by the conjugate, there is no middle term. It gets a, There is, but it cancels itself. All right, look at number seven. Again, whenever you see a radical sign in the top or the bottom, almost always you're going to need to, to factor. When you do direct substitution, what do you get? Um, you get, so, the zero on the top, and then... 
You don't really need a calculator to do that. You got 49 times 49 minus uh -huh. 49 oh, four, 49. Times 49. Okay. So you get zero on the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. And since I can't, I can actually factor an, an X out of the bottom, but all right, I'll do that. Eh, no, I'm not. I'm going to leave it unfactored for the moment. Okay. Just because if I were to factor out an X from the bottom, it wouldn't immediately help me. I'm still going to get 0 over 0. And I, I haven't made any progress on getting this thing down to a number where it's not 0 over 0. But I'm seeing a radical sign. I'm seeing difference here. That means I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. Okay. There's the conjugate of the top. I have to multiply the bottom by the same thing. So I'm multiplying that fraction by that. And I'm going to write it down here. What's the top give me? Um, let's see, you get 49 plus... 7 root x Keep going. Uh, minus 7 root x. Remember those two terms are always going to cancel. You don't even cancel need to out. do that. Oh, right, right. Okay. So just do the, last, then, just do the last part. Um, What's root x times root x? Is it just x? or? Yep. It's just x? Okay. Just like that. Now, I think I will take an x out of the bottom okay because what's left is 49 minus x beautiful and i still have this over here that i have to multiply everything by in other words you can't forget to multiply the bottom by the same thing you multiplied the top by right and do not worry about multiplying these together in fact, it's something you should never do. Okay. okay. Notice, cancel, cancel. Now I've got 1 over x times 7 plus square root of x. What's that go to as x goes to 49? Um, we know it's not going to be yeah. 0 over 0 because we got a 1 in the numerator. So we're done as soon as you come up with what that is. Okay, sorry, one second, I'm just writing. Um, okay, so it's 7 plus 7 is 14 times 49. Yeah, and that's what right, it is. So it's 686. 686? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that really... If without trig functions, I don't think there is a third method. You're always going to either be factoring or multiplying by the conjugate. Now, well, number eight looks kind of interesting. Number eight. Notice what I get by direct substitution. I get 3 over 0 minus 3 over 0. Well, that's kind of like infinity minus infinity. That is also indeterminate. I do not know what that is going to be. Okay. Okay. So, let's see. I think if I merely add or subtract these two fractions by finding a common denominator, that's the third method. I forgot about it. So that's the third method. So my common denominator is t squared plus t, which means i got to multiply this term on the left by 3 uh, t plus 1 over t times t plus 1. And then I'm going to subtract 
3 over t times t plus 1. Make sure you see every step I did there. Yeah. In other words, is all I did is multiply this by, uh, this was the common denominator. Okay. Well, now I end up with 3t plus 3 minus 3, so just 3t in the numerator, and the denominator ends up with that. And the t's cancel. In other words, after you do all your manipulations, there's only three things you can do. You can either factor, you can multiply by the conjugate, or you can go ahead and find a least common denominator. Okay. okay. And you found the least common denominator by just, um, did you factor out the bottom and then? Yeah. In, in other okay. words, I could tell that that was t times t plus 1. Mm -hmm. Since this is t, the least common denominator is going to be t times t plus 1. Right. Okay. Okay. And now it turns into 3 over t plus 1. Well, as t goes to 0, that turns into 3. Okay, now let's examine that problem. There's no multiplying by the conjugate, and there's no real factoring that helps us immediately. At some point, we had to factor the t out of the numerator and the denominator, but we didn't do it immediately. What we immediately did was subtract those two fractions. And the way you subtract fractions is by finding a least common denominator. Right, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. They're getting harder. So let's see. We have the following. Let me write it just so I can... That's less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to x squared minus 3x plus 2. Well, we know we got to factor that. Almost always, whenever you see something that you can factor, you should always factor it, especially if it's a quadratic. Okay? That factors into x minus 2 times x minus 1. And what is the limit as x goes to 3? Well, the limit of f of x as x goes to 3. Well, let's see. Well, by direct substitution, we get 2 is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to 2. So what does f of x go to as x goes to 3? Um... Two? Yeah, if f of x is greater than or equal to 2 and less than or equal to 2, then it can, it's got to be 2. There's only one answer that it can be. Okay. Okay. And this one's a little bit of a strange one. I don't get too many limit problems like that, but it looks like we're going to get another one here. So, I got... 10x is less than or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal 5x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 10. Well... Let's factor out a 5. I can actually do a lot more factoring, but I'm going to see if this doesn't 
take care of the problem immediately. And now if I substitute x goes to 1, it might take care of the problem because I get 10 is less than or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal. If I substitute 1 here, I get 10. Mm -hmm. g of x must go to 10 as x goes to 1. And, in fact, I don't have to do anything here. I can just direct substitute. I could have done it with the previous problem also. I just didn't realize it at the time. Okay. Yeah, the previous problem, if I just do direct substitution, I get 2 less than or equal to f of x less than or equal to 2, which means it has to go to 2. Okay. I didn't really need to factor this. Notice I don't need to take that 5 out of there. If I substitute mm -hmm. 1 immediately, I get 10 less than the function, less than or equal to 10. So these are actually particularly easy. You don't really have to do anything but direct substitution. Okay. And if direct substitution yields 0 on the left and 0 on the right, then the function is going to go to 0. That is not 0 divided by 0. That's 0 is less than the function, which is less than 0. The function could only be 0. Giving you some different looking ones. We get with direct substitution. Um, so you get forty nine. Uh, oh, it's just forty nine, right? Yep. Those are the easy ones, where direct substitution, as long as it does not produce 0 over 0, you're home free. Okay. What's direct substitution give you here? Um, 0 on the top, and then oh, 0 on the bottom. So zero over zero. Okay. Zero to zero. Mm. Now. I'm thinking. What can we do? Here? Let me think for a second. Could try multiplying by the conjugate. Absolute values are a little tricky. Let's see what happens if we multiply this thing by the conjugate. What do I have to multiply the top by? Um, 9 plus the absolute value of x. Yep. And the bottom, same thing. And at this point, you need to add parentheses to the bottom. Otherwise, it won't actually be this if I didn't add those parentheses. No. Now, still, ah, I don't get 0 over 0. What do I get? You get 81. Um, Hold on. Uh, oh. Yeah, in the top, you get what? 81, and then is it the absolute value of x, or, uh, yeah, the absolute value of x squared? Yeah, okay. that's still 0, and the bottom is still 0. So, at first glance, that didn't appear to do anything. 
but it actually does. If I look at the top, 81 minus the absolute value of x squared is the same as 81 minus that. Right. In other words, I can remove that absolute value sign. However, I still get 0 in the top, and I still get 0 in the bottom. Hmm. I'm thinking, hold on. This is a limit problem that I'm not sure I've come across before where they throw in absolute values. Um, I actually can. Isn't, isn't the bottom, though, 81 plus x squared? Well, mm, not yet it's not. Um, oh, hold on, yeah. Um, let's see. 81 minus x squared actually does factor into 9 minus x times 9 plus x. And that is going to give us a solution, I believe. Because in the bottom, we have 9 plus x times 9 plus absolute value of x. And I can cancel the 9 plus x's. And now I got 9 minus x over 9 plus absolute value of x. What happens as x goes to minus 9? Um, it's going to be 0 over, or is it just 0? 18 in the top, and 18. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's negative 9, okay. And 18 in the bottom, oh, it's one. so that thing goes okay. to 1. Yeah, interesting. So, moral of this particular story this was pretty complicated. We first of all had to multiply by the conjugate, top mm -hmm. and bottom. Then, after we got this, we need to realize that the absolute value of x quantity squared is the same as x squared. Notice that no matter whether x is positive or negative, when I square it, it's going to become positive. So what mm -hmm. I have circled there definitely goes to that. Okay. And I still get 0 over 0 until I factor it again. So this particular problem required not only to multiply by the conjugate, but then also to factor your answer. And once I factor the answer, always cancel out whatever looks exactly the same and deal with what's left. And it turns out that what is left is 18 over 18. Okay. Okay. So that's probably going to be the secret on all problems that have absolute value in them, is um, first of all multiplying by the conjugate, and then second, figuring out what absolute value of x squared is. It allows you to remove the absolute value sign. Okay, let's look at this one. And this time we're going to zero from the left side only. Well, that would make that negative infinity minus positive infinity. 
Well, turns out that's actually... That's negative infinity. That's not indeterminate. So that's the answer, just negative infinity? Well, here's the thing with indeterminates. Here's some indeterminates. Let me give you a bunch of them. Zero over zero is indeterminate. Infinity over infinity is indeterminate. Infinity minus infinity is indeterminate. It's not zero. Bottom. And this one on the upper right is not one. Any more than zero divided by zero is not always one. Okay? So mm -hmm. when you have answers like this, they're indeterminate and you have to do more work. But notice that if I have uh, infinity plus infinity, that's not indeterminate. That's two infinities. That's infinity. Mm -hmm. Well, in our previous problem, we ended up with negative infinity minus an infinity. That's the same as negative infinity plus a negative infinity. And two negative infinities become minus two infinity. So that's minus infinity. Now, what was that one? That was number 13? Yes. I'm a little curious as to whether they're going to say that that is minus 13 or does not exist. I mean, minus infinity or does not exist. Uh, is there any way that we can... Uh... Yeah, I can check right now. I have my... Okay. Let's see what they say for number 14. Hold on. That's better off when I was reading it. Uh, in fact, not 14, 13. 13, okay. Um, yeah, it was negative infinity. Okay, good. Sometimes I think math teachers tend to use the word infinity and undefined interchangeably. And they're not. Really, they're not interchangeable. Sometimes you take a limit and it really is infinity. Mm -hmm. um, if I said x squared over 2, no, if I said 1 over x squared as x goes to 0, that's 0. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. That's positive infinity. Let's examine that just for a minute, just because I think I can make it a little more understandable. Okay. If I took the limit of 1 over x as x goes to 0, that does not exist because if I go from to 0 from the left, I get negative infinity. If I go to 0 from the right, I get positive infinity. They're not the same, so the limit does not exist. However, if I take the limit of 1 over x squared as x goes to 0, that does exist. From the left goes to positive infinity. From the right goes to positive infinity. Because they're the same, the limit exists, and it is positive infinity. Okay. And notice what the graphs look like. The graph of this one looks like this. You can clearly see that as we approach zero from the right, we're going to positive infinity. As we approach it from the left, we're going to negative infinity. But the second function looks like this. As I approach zero from the left and the right, or the right, I'm going to positive infinity. It's the same thing, so the limit does exist. Mm -hmm. You'll actually find some math teachers that will want to say this does not exist, but it 
actually does the bottom one. All right, so the last one ended up being negative infinity, right? Yes. Well, let's do the exact same logic on this one. As we approach x from the right only, what's 7 over x go to? Um, 0. Well, it's 7 over 0. That's positive infinity. Oh, uh, okay. And this one is 7 over 0. That's also positive infinity. So uh, I don't know what that is. If my answer just says positive infinity minus positive infinity, that's indeterminate. But if I go back and re-examine the problem, in other words, as I approach x, as x goes to 0, and I'm only considering it from the right side, then this function actually becomes 7 over x minus 7 over x. Right? In other words, mm -hmm. if x is always positive, then the absolute value of x is the same as x. Okay. Well, 7 over x minus 7 over x, 0. Okay. So number 14 goes to 0. <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. One more? Yeah, actually, I don't, um, I know I sent one more, there's like a graphing one. Okay. Maybe it's not, I can send it if it didn't show up in the email. Okay, it doesn't look like it showed up, but let's do this one first, because this is a little okay. different. This has a trig function in it. Trig functions you have to kind of treat differently. In other words, the three techniques we used aren't going to do us much good on this. First of all, they give you one to memorize, and it's this one right here. One I've circled. Mm -hmm. They tell you what that is without proving it. That's one. If you go into your graphing calculator and you graph sine x divided by x, It'll look like this. And it goes up to 1 at 0, and then goes back, and it's asymptotic with the x-axis. So this definitely goes to 1. And like I said, you just have to memorize that. Okay. You have to know that sine x over x, notice by direct substitution, it's 0 over 0. Mm-hmm. But it turns out that it is 1, and it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg problem. They, they have to tell you to memorize this because they haven't given you the technique yet to solve it. You don't get that until second semester calculus. And then they teach you something called L'Hopital's Rule. And then you can solve it easily using L'Hopital's Rule. But... Since they have, you haven't had that, they just have to kind of tell you, memorize this. Okay? So, that being the case, i got to try to turn that in to sine of 9x over 9x. Because if I can turn it into sine of 9x over 9x, I'll know that that quantity is 1. Okay? Okay? Well, how do I turn it into sine of 9x over 9x? Well, how about if we multiply top and bottom by 9? Just like that. Now, you can take that part right there, and you know that goes to 1. It doesn't matter whether it's sine of x over x, sine of 9x over 9x, sine of a million x over a million. 
x is going to go to 1. Well, if this goes to 1 and it's being multiplied by 9, then that limit is 9. Okay. Okay. And I didn't get a graph. Why don't you go ahead and send it separately? I just did, yeah. Because there's no way to do those without me looking at the graph. Let's see, it should have just sent. Yeah. All right. So, do these individually. First of all, what is the limit of f of x as x goes to 2? Um, is it 1? Actually, it's not. It's this point right there. Oh, so it's 2? Well, notice why. If I go to 2 from the right, it's definitely that point, 2. And if I head towards 2 from the left, it's definitely that point. Mm -hmm. The fact that the function evaluates at this point down there, 1, does not matter. The limit as we go to 2 is 2. In other words, it's this point over here that I'm pointing at. Can you see my cursor mm -hmm. when I point? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of a strange limit. you got to get a little used to this. The limit does exist because it's the same coming from the right as it is the left. It's okay. The limit is not equal to f of 2, which seems strange, but get used to it as part of calculus. So this goes to 2, and now g of x, as we go x equals 2, what does it go to? Um, oh, g of x. Is it 0? Yeah. And in other words, the way you do these limit problems with graphs is just hop on board the graph and head towards x of 2. Well, that's where it's headed towards. And then read the y value. That's the secret with limit problems. Hop on board the graph, head towards the x value, read the y value. Well, okay. if I head towards 2 from the left, I'm going to 0. If I head towards 2 from the right, I'm going to 0. zero. Okay. Uh, that limit is 0. So the sum of the limits is the same as the limit of the sum. In other words, the limit of f of x plus g of x is the same as the limit of f of x plus the limit of g of x. Okay. Well, we figured that f of x was 2, g of x was 0, 2 is the answer. Okay. Okay. Now, well, I hate the way they drew this graph. <laughs> the thing I hate about it is the way they labeled it. it that is one confusing label. you got to get kind of used to it. They, they put uh -huh. ones here, and the ones over here, and then the zero. It's hard to figure out where, where the x-axis and the y-axis is. I, I guess uh -huh. if you look at x and y, not so hard. But All right, let's do b. What's the limit of f of x as x goes to 1? 1. And let's do this one, g of x. What's the limit as x goes to 1? from the right. 1. What's the limit as x goes to 1 from the left? Um, 2. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Okay, because it's not the same. Right. And this one, it's clear why the limit doesn't exist. There's a big jump discontinuity there. Well, there is with mm -hmm. this one over here also, but that part actually goes to the same number. So this limit exists, this one does not, and if you take a limit that exists and add it to a limit that does not exist, then the answer is does not exist. 
Okay. So f of x does exist. But you can't add a number to a does not exist. Okay. Yes, that makes sense. Number C. What's f of x go to as x goes to zero? Zero. What's g of x go to as x goes to zero? Um, zero. No, hop on board the function. Oh, it's right here. Oh, like. And head towards zero, which is that point there. So okay. My function looks like it's headed to about one and a half. I don't care what the decimal is because I'm multiplying it by zero. In other words, f right. of x went to zero, so regardless of what g of x went to, zero times any number is zero. Right, okay. Right. Now, uh, what's f of x go to as x goes to minus 1? Um, not minus 1. Uh-huh. Or like a little bit, okay. Right, that point right there, which is minus 1, okay. And then as g of x goes to minus 1, what does f of x go to? Um, 0. Okay, so what would, did f of x go to when minus, minus 1? Uh -huh. And g of x clearly goes to 0 as x goes to minus 1. And it goes to 0 whether I'm going to the left or to the right. Mm -hmm. So that limit is definitely zero. So my problem becomes what is, in other words, the limit of f of x divided by g of x is the limit of f of x divided by the limit of g of x. Well, that's minus 1 divided by zero. What does that go to? Zero. No. Oh. Negative infinity. Just negative. Oh, is it infinity? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. Let's talk about this. This is something that an awful lot of students have trouble with. They want to make this thing go to zero, which it does. But then they want to make any number divided by zero go to zero. And That's it right. Okay. Notice what happens as if I say 1 over x, and I let x get smaller and smaller and smaller, well, the first thing is 1 over 0.1, which is 10. And then I got 1 over 0 0.01, which is 100. See what's happening? Mm -hmm. 1 over 0 0 0.001, which is 1,000. So as the denominator heads to 0 from the positive side, the function goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, in our problem, we are headed, we ended up with, um, what did we end up with? How come I can't get back to it? We ended up oh, with minus 1 over 0. In other words, the limit of f of x was minus 1. The limit of g of x was 0 for sure, and we don't really have to worry anymore about whether we're approaching 0 from the left or right. Minus 1 divided by 0, the limit of that is negative infinity. If it was positive 1 divided by 0, it would be positive infinity. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe. Do you have an answer on this one, D? Um, yeah, I can check really fast. It says enter a number when I type it in. When you type negative infinity in? Yeah. 
and it says it doesn't, it doesn't give me the option to um, select like an infinity all right well I think the answer is negative infinity but a positive it, it might be does not exist although I don't think so I really do think it's negative infinity uh, I'm not sure how you're supposed to type that in. You could try putting minus 1 divided by 0. Like that any better? Um, no, it didn't. Okay. I'm not sure what it's looking for there. Okay, yeah, I can figure that out. Um, are E and F all that we have left here? Yes. All right. Shall we do them? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 8 o'clock, but I'm willing. It won't take okay. to do these. Yeah, thank you. So we're doing this as x goes to 2. Well, as x goes to 2, what does f of x go to? Um, it goes to... Is it 2 again? Uh-huh. And it does exist. It's just 2, which means now we have 2 cubed times 2. That's 16. Okay. And finally, the last one. We got the square root of 3 plus f of x as x goes to 1. What's f of x go to as x goes to 1? 1. So now we got square root of 4. So 2. <clears throat> Let me look at that for just a minute. Yeah, so 2. Okay. All right. Morgan, I hope I've cleared things up a little bit. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, limits can be a little intimidating, but just always remember when you're reading a graph and trying to figure out the limit, just put your cursor on the function and head towards the x value that it's pointing you to. Uh-huh. And then read the y value. Okay. Okay. And in this one here is a great example where they're not the same. You know, that uh -huh. one points to 2, this one points to 1. If they're not the same number, then that limit does not exist at x equal 1. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And you can just, can you still just send an invoice to my mom? Definitely. I can send you your email again if you would like. I, I'm sure I have it. It's okay. Patty, she hasn't changed it, has she, in two or three years? No, it should, yeah, n2p at msn.com. Okay. I'll okay, sounds good. I'll probably ta be talking to you again soon. <laughs> okay, Morgan. Happy to help. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye.